All right, we're about ready to get started for the next one. Micah, do you want to do the introduction? Sure, I would love to because uh, not just because I know Mandy, but I do know Mandy. She's awesome. So Mandy Hubbard is uh, passionate about software quality, good processes, and great documentation. She spent almost 20 years in QA leadership roles where she focused on ensuring the best experience for end users. And when she discovered CICD, she was immediately interested because she saw it as a way to expand software quality. So, um, you know, she wanted to create processes that made it easier for developers to run tests while also preventing developers from merging their code until tests were successful. So we didn't like Mandy, us developers. We didn't <laughs> like Mandy for a while, but now we do. Now we do. We love Mandy now, but we didn't at first, but now we do. Um, but, you know, uh, there was a time when developers were not too keen on, you know, test suites running. If you're old like me, you remember those times. Um, so I'm really uh, excited to hear Mandy's session and uh, let's bring her in to say hi. Hey, Mandy, welcome. Hello, Mandy. Hey, hey, hey. First request is that you unmute yourself. <laughs> It's super, just a requirement. Super valid everybody. request. Thanks. <laughs> it's so good to see you, everyone. I feel like I'm amongst friends today. You are, for sure. Very cool. So um, what, are you, what are you talking about today? I have it right in front of me, but I'd love to hear you just do a little intro for your talk before, yeah, we, sure. uh, before we share um, your screen up there. Can you see my screen? No, not yet, but we will. Don't worry. Okay, cool. Just, uh, just chatting a little bit. Yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about zero trust security and the zero trust security model, specifically um, how to utilize it to secure your Kubernetes cluster. How's that sound? Oh, neat. That sounds that great. That sounds awesome. Good. Right, well, Good. Uh, why don't we, uh, we'll, we'll take a step back and we'll add your screen there and uh, take it away. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining me today to talk about zero trust security. Um, Micah did a great job introducing me, but um, for anyone just joining, I'm Mandy Hubbard. I live here in Austin, Texas. I've lived here since uh, moving from Tupelo, Mississippi, right after high school to go to UT. It's a super great place to live. I um, have spent most of my career in QA roles. Um, I really was focused on creating good experiences for end users. At that time, those were customers of our software. Um, I pivoted into developer advocacy kind of taking that same passion for giving end users the same experience, but now my end users are developers and I work to help utilize um, their feedback to create great pro products to facilitate good software development. Um, like Micah said, I am pretty much a CICD nerd. I didn't know it existed um, back in my early QA days. And once I found it, I was immediately in love. It was love at first sight. Uh, because without a solid CI CD pipeline, quality code doesn't really matter because we can't ensure that the right bits get to the end user. So I'm really interested in CI CD. Um, I'm currently a senior software, um, senior software developer. I'm currently a senior developer advocate for architect.io. Uh, architect is a dependency aware deployment platform for deploying your applications to Kubernetes. So we handle the dependencies and we can deploy to your external Kubernetes clusters, or you can deploy to a free preview environment in the architect community cloud, which is really cool for being able to get early feedback and do iterative development and so on. So if you get a chance, I'd love it if you headed over to architect.io and signed up for a free account, check it out and um, let me know, let me know what you think. Um, so yeah, I like, I like developing software, I like quality, I like processes, but I do have some more human interest. Um, I really like cats, especially my cat Theo, who will make a visit later if you're paying attention. Um, I also really like crystals and astrology and um, kundalini yoga and a bunch of kind of woo-woo stuff that I think rounds out my technical edges pretty nicely. But today we're gonna talk about zero trust security We'll talk about the zero, zero trust security model, which will lead us into talking about the Kubernetes security model so you can understand how the network works by default. We'll pivot into a brief introduction of Kubernetes services so you can understand how to use them to facilitate zero trust security. Um, that will lead us into 
Kubernetes network policies, which is the highlight um, of this talk, is understanding how to use those to secure your network. And then we'll walk through a really simple example so you can get an idea of the types of policies that you would want to implement in your own cluster. So let's start with the zero, zero trust security model. Because a zero trust network is simply a network that operates according to the zero trust security model. Um, now, the zero trust security model has been around for a long time. I think I initially saw 2005, but when I continued doing some digging, um, it's actually first uh, was first uh, established in the early 90s, if you can believe that. But it's really a hot um, topic in software development these days. In fact, in January of this year, the White House um, actually issued a memorandum specifying its own zero trust security architecture for any uh, federal applications. And it stated that it's going to begin requiring agencies to meet certain cybersecurity standards by the end of fiscal year 2024. So zero trust security is really at its peak. But what is zero trust security? It is, thank you. It's a philosophy, a model, an ideal, and a goal. It's not a prescriptive set of actions, but it's more of a North Star to aim for in setting up your security policies. Um, it can be implemented in various ways using various tools, but at its heart, it is a trust no one approach to security. And one of the main tenets of the zero trust model is that uh, there is no safe network security, uh, no safe network perimeter. You know, back in the day when we talked about networks, we used the old castle and moat analogy where your moat is your VPN. And if you could get across the moat, then you had the keys to the castle. And as long as the drawbridge was raised, you were safe because you had your moat or your VPN. Well, with zero trust security, there really is no network perimeter that is safe. If you think about it with cloud computing, you may have resources in different cloud environments hosted by different vendors. Some of your resources may still be on prem and they all need to communicate in a safe way. So you really have a lot less control over your network perimeter than you did back uh, with, you know, the security models that we were used to before cloud came into the picture. And um, but we're going to stick with the uh, the castle and moat uh, analogy to explain zero trust security a little bit further. Um, with zero trust security, imagine that you do manage to get across the moat, whatever security mechanisms are in place. All you'll find is a locked castle with a huge iron door that you can't penetrate. And if you were to penetrate it, you would simply find a bunch of other locked doors. And the best stuff would be kept behind doors that you didn't even know about, you know, a bunch of secret doors. Um, because uh, a big tenet of zero trust security is unlisted IP addresses and undiscoverable services, i.e. these doors you don't know about. Um, the less we advertise our resources, uh, the less likely an attacker is to find a way into the network. Um, you know, on the same note, like you don't want to advertise your resources that hold your private data. If an attacker doesn't know it exists, then they can't really go after it. Um, so that's why we lock things down and only services that need to know about other services um, have that information. It's not just publicly available. Another important concept with zero trust networking is that resources that need to communicate with each other will need to reconnect and re-verify frequently. So it's not enough just to create an initial connection and then run indefinitely. Um, there will be periodic re reconnect and re-verify efforts so that if someone does infiltrate a particular resource, they don't automatically get access to every other resource that it has access to because there will be a reconnect and re-verify process that an attacker won't be able to uh, get through. Um, so zero trust security really focuses on the uh, principle of least privilege, which just simply means that your resources should have the absolute bare bones, minimum privilege and permissions necessary to do their jobs. There was a time when we gave resources access to all, of our resor all other resources just in case they needed it. It really made development easy because you know, if you needed to consume resources, they were available to you to work with and you didn't have to set up a bunch of security protocols during your development process. 
But once you get to production, each of your resources needs to be locked down and you need to take a real, um, you know, intentional approach to which permissions that you give those resources. Again, so that if an attacker does gain access, um, they don't have the ability to move laterally through your network and compromise all of your resources. And then finally, a really big tenet of zero, zero trust security is that you should transmit your security telemetry data to a logging system so that you have it available uh, in the event of a breach. It's first of all going to be a, a way you can identify that a breach occurred. And then it will also allow you to quickly find the root cause of the, of the breach, find that vulnerability and shut it down quickly. Without this telemetry data, you may not know that a breach has occurred until you know there's a much larger consequence from the attacker down the line. So it's really important that you log your security telemetry and use that telemetry regularly to ensure that your network is secure, that there aren't unknown attackers. All right, so that's the zero trust security model that we use when we implement a zero trust security network. So now let's step into a quick talk about the Kubernetes network model. Um, once you understand how networking is set up in, in Kubernetes by default, you can understand why it's so important to be intentional about your network security. Um, first and foremost, all containers in a Kubernetes cluster can communicate with each other, even across nodes. Um, as you know, your cluster is going to consist of various nodes, and on those nodes, you have pods, which then run your containers. And without an, an explicit network policy on your Kubernetes cluster, all of those pods are going to be able to speak with one another. All the containers are going to be able to speak with one another, and they're going to be accessible by the outside world. So all connections to and from your pods are wide open to all traffic, which is definitely not a secure way to run an application. Additionally, um, the way that you would communicate with those pods and containers and the way that they can communicate with one another is with um, an external IP address. But since pods by their very nature are volatile, that's not a stable way to, um, to access resources in your application stack. So that leads us into a quick chat about Kubernetes services. So a Kubernetes service is an abstraction that represents a logical set of pods, whereas the external IP address is tied to a particular instance of a pod at runtime um, that's going to change. A service is kind of like a pointer to whatever pod or pods happen to be running at runtime. And this is going to act as a single entity to the outside world. And what's also cool about using services is that it acts as a single entity to your developers. So developers typically aren't um, as enmeshed in you know, network protocols and understanding low level networking concepts just by interest. Um, but when you use a Kubernetes service, you can really distill your application components and the way that they run in your Kubernetes cluster down to a set of boxes that really look very similar to your architecture diagram. And then developers can look at the set of services and very easily know what sort of communication to set up between those because that's the way they architected the application. Um, so with a Kubernetes service, you've got a reliable point of entry from for the outside world and also between services running in your cluster. And then they're going to live until they're explicitly destroyed. So even if your pods aren't running, you're still going to have uh, the notion of a service until you explicitly destroy that service. Um, and so that'll stay alive and you can bring in pods as you wish, but that service is going to be a constant. Okay, so we've talked about the uh, zero trust security model and a little bit about the Kubernetes network um, that's set up by default when you have a cluster, a new cluster. And then we touch a little bit on Kubernetes services, um, what the benefits are and why you would want to use them. So now let's jump into Kubernetes network policies. So Kubernetes network policies are how we're actually going to specify the connectivity between the different services specified in your application stack. You're going to use Kubernetes network policies to specify your ingress and egress rules 
uh, between your services in the outside world and between the individual services that comprise your application stack. Um, as I'm sure you're familiar with, ingress refers to traffic coming into a pod and egress is the traffic going outbound from the pod. Now, you can certainly configure your egress rules very granularly as well. Um, it's not as necessary unless you're running um, a very tight application like financial systems or something with very sensitive data. For the purpose of this conversation, we're going to focus on ingress, but know that you do also use Kubernetes network policies to configure your egress rules and also that they must be configured separately for each service. Um, so in other words, it's not a bi-directional communication. You have to specify what traffic is allowed into a particular service as well as what traffic is allowed out from a particular service. And there are multiple ways to specify which traffic is allowed to and from. Um, here are a couple um, here on the slide. You can use namespaces, IP blocks. Um, you can use labels. Um, you can even lock it down by protocol and port so that even if the traffic is coming from a trusted resource, if it's coming on the wrong port or it's the wrong protocol, it's not something that your you know, service is expecting, there's no reason to receive that traffic and it would deny access to that traffic. So you get really granular control over what traffic is allowed in and out of the pods in your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Now, um, the cool thing is that the way you set up Kubernetes network policies is by specifying them in a YAML file. Again, this makes networking and uh, network security so much more accessible to developers because developers know YAML. That's a familiar language. As long as you, you know, take a look at the spec and see what's required, and a developer can very easily put together um, a Kubernetes network policy manifest using YAML um, versus having to understand low-level networking um, protocols and stuff like that. So once you have created this YAML file, you'll apply it to your Kubernetes cluster using the Kubernetes API. Um, so you may think, I've configured my ingress and egress rules. I've locked it down by protocol and port, and I'm really satisfied with it. I'm, I'm ready to go. I've applied it to my Kubernetes cluster. But you might be surprised to learn that if you apply it to your Kubernetes cluster, it's not going to do anything at all until you um, enforce it using a network policy plugin. So a network policy plugin is responsible for actually enforcing those rules that you applied to your Kubernetes cluster via your manifest file. And typically, network policy plugins um, conform to the container network interface or CNI spec. And what this allows is, um, well, first of all, CNI provides a, a bunch of libraries that facilitate development of the plugins. Um, so that makes it uh, able to be very feature rich. But also, um, CNI really aims to make container networking pluggable. If you use a plugin that conforms to the CNI spec, it's going to work not only in your Kubernetes cluster, but if you were to move to, say, Amazon ECS or um, OpenShift or Cloud Foundry or some other container runtime environment, uh, these plugins are going to support most well-known container runtime environments as well, which prevents you from being you know, locked into a, a single runtime environment. Um, so plugins are installed on your cluster. And you'll want to look um, at what plugins come installed by default. At Architect, we use two um, plugins called Calico and Cilium. And we found that for most of the public cloud providers, those are already available. But there's some cases where you may have some other default plugin installed that you're uh, on your cluster that you'll need to actually uninstall before you can successfully install these. And of course, you'll want to reference the spec for the particular plugins to you know, set up your YAML file to take advantage of their features. And you'll likely want to use more than one plugin because they each plugin kind of has um, some specialty that it um, that it offers. And so you can use a combination of plugins to get a really rich feature set for configuring network policies. OK, so now we have talked about Kubernetes network policies. Hopefully you have an idea of how to specify them and have an understanding of you know, the types of network policies you could use to enforce those. I'm sorry, the network plugins you could use to enforce those policies. Um, let's just take a look at a simple Kubernetes um, network policy manifest. 
This manifest is used to deny all ingress ingress traffic to all pods. It's um, you know simple YAML probably looks familiar to all of you. And then um, this one is a little bit more involved. This one breaks it down. Um, first of all, it's got ingress and egress rules, and it uh, specifies um, an IP block. It uses protocols and ports um, to give a real granular approach to um, network security. So that's what it looks like. Um, that's how that's the meat of a Kubernetes network policy right there in that file. So now that you have an idea of, you know, what's going on in your network by default, what you need to do to secure it, um, you know about policies and plugins and a little bit about services to help facilitate this, you're probably wondering, but what policies do I specify? And that's a really good question. But like most questions in software development, the answer is it depends. It obviously is going to depend on your application stack, what sort of communication you need between resources, what sort of communication you're going to allow from the external environment. But for the sake of this conversation, let's take a really simple application stack. I'm sure we're all familiar with applications that consist of a front end, an API, and a database. And I want you to take a minute and look at this diagram and, and think of these as um, these are all individual Kubernetes services, um, obviously not the internet, that's our outside world, but front end API and database represent Kubernetes services for the components in our application stack. And this represents what connectivity looks like in a Kubernetes network cluster by default and before you apply any policies. You've got complete bi-directional communication with external users and the individual services within your application stack, and you have full bi-directional communication between the individual services in your application stack. So the first policy you would want to apply is a deny all ingress policy, which we saw manifest for in an earlier slide. First thing you do is you just lock everything down tight, and then you begin opening up access as needed. And the next thing that um, we recommend is that you use an API gateway. An API gateway is going to serve as the entry point into your application stack. It will intercept traffic from the outside world, um, perform some authentication and authorization, which is out of scope for this conversation, but obviously a huge part of network security. And then it will decide where to send the traffic. So the first uh, or the next rule you'll need to add to your network policies is um, a rule that allows ingress into your API gateway from the outside network or the internet. And then that gateway is going to send traffic into your application stack. That's obviously going to be your front end application. Um, and so there'll be an ingress rule that allows traffic to flow into your front end application. Your front end application will then need to send requests to your API and the API will need to communicate with your database to get data from and send data to uh, the backend database for storage. So um, this is a diagram of a really simple application stack and the network connectivity you would want to set up with Kubernetes network policies. Um, so what you, you don't see is any communication with the individual services and the outside network or any communication between say your front end and your database or your database and your API gateway because it's not necessary. So if someone were to infiltrate um, your API, they could only send traffic to your database. They couldn't send traffic to your front end and vice versa. So this is um, an example of following that, privilege, that principle of least privilege where we give the bare minimum access necessary to perform the job here. Um, and this is something that's going to look really familiar to your developers because when they plan their applications, it's a bunch of boxes and arrows. And when they plan their network security using Kubernetes network policies, it's a bunch of boxes and arrows. It's really accessible and it allows you to start thinking about your network security very early on in the development lifecycle. All right, so that's it. We did it. Um, we've briefly touched on the zero trust security model. We chatted about the network, uh, the Kubernetes network model. We spoke about Kubernetes services, and then we talked about Kubernetes network policies. 
That's all you need to know to get started with Zero Trust Networking. Obviously, that's absolutely untrue. Zero Trust Networking has a lot of components, and we focus on this small subset of Kubernetes network policies. And what I hope is that this has piqued your interest and in giving you some really accessible information to go and start looking at implementing security using this model on your own. Um, so as promised, Theo's here to thank you for hanging out with us today. We hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, um, I'll be around for a bit after uh, the presentation. We've got chat. And then after this broadcast, I'm always available. Find me on Twitter. Send me questions. If I've got answers, I'll send them your way. If not, I really love to learn with you and um, start exploring more about Zero Trust Networking. All right. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thanks so much, Mandy. That was a great presentation. Thank and you. Uh, yeah, we'll... we'll We'll push questions into the chat for folks to ask you there if you if you don't mind checking that out when you get a chance. Not a problem. I'll do that. All right. Have a good one.